I started off with primary school, I went to primary school in Wanganui. Uh, I went to Kiwi Street School, did all my schooling down there, my primary school, went to Wanganui Intermediate School, then I went to secondary school. But from the age of nine, I wanted to become one of the biggest and strongest men in the world. That's how it all began. I grew up in a neighbourhood in Talbot Street. It was uh, in my days in the 70s, it was one of the worst, second, second of worst streets in Wanganui. It was, uh, there were two streets, Tobel Street and Matapo Street. It was a bit of a, a bit of a rough neighbourhood, you know. But um, I actually enjoyed it there. I played a lot of sport down there. Oh, you was always sport-minded. You used to always go in um, children's athletics. Then he was in the Harrier Club. Because his father was very sport-minded, not me. <laughs> he got that from his dad. I did a lot of athletics. I played soccer, you know, I was a soccer player. I played centre-half when I was young. Um, as I got older, I played rugby, but um, yeah, I did gymnastics. I used to dive off diving boards. Uh, I used to row in the Wangani River. I used to be a rower. Um, rowed the fours and the eights. Um, yeah, basically, I pretty much did. I played cricket. The only thing I didn't really play was badminton, tennis, and uh, basketball. But he was a good kid, though. Eh? He never, never caused us any trouble. You're Not like old. he does now. You're I had this. Uh, like I was different from other children, you know, I could lift things and do things that other children couldn't do, like I could rip phone books, you know, I could do, I could lift, or as I got older I could lift cars off the ground, you know, so I, and I always thought to myself that I was actually here for something, I was different, you know, yeah, I wasn't like the normal, the normal kid. He was a skinny little boy when he was in the army, and he was never this size until he started a strong man. I don't know, just like I said, from the age of nine, I wanted to be one of the biggest and strongest men in the world. I got, you know, like normal kids, you know, you want a dumbbell, you want a barbell when, you, when you're young, so you was too young to join a gym. So I got my parents for Christmas and that, I asked them to buy me some plates and some dumbbells, and I just started training at home. And then once I turned, um, once I got to 16, I think it was, that's when I actually joined a gym in Wanganui. Yeah, Drew's Avenue, and that's all. Levy turned up one day there as a little hairy-legged schoolboy, about 14 years old and decided he wanted to train with weights, and that's where we sort of met. Yeah, yeah and then I asked, every, my birthdays, I asked mum if I could have a three month membership for my birthday. And I used to skateboard to the gym and skateboard home and, yeah. Oh, well, everything straight away was hard out, you know. Um, but he listened to what we said and he, you know, but he passed past what we told him. He wanted to be strong, man, he wanted to be as big as he could. So City Gym used to be around here. This is where the gym originally was way back in the 80s. Um, we had a fire in around about 92. So we shifted here in 92 and we set this gym up here. And to build my legs up, because I was only a little fella, you know, to build my legs up when I was at college, I, used to, I took the seat off my bike, you know, so you couldn't sit down. Yeah, so I just did really weird things. Like people thought I was crazy, you know. Like, you know, what would you, you know, why would you take a set of a bike for? But I had reasons for things I did. And after school, or sometimes go for running, you ready for the, for the, the mass, always for the yeah. area club. You never go anywhere, <laughs> that, that sort of thing. A little discipline, like, like I said, it started like way back in the days where I had to go for a run every day, you know, and um, before I went to play. So I think it was with them making me do things, it sort of, as I got older, it sort of kept me in line with what I had to do, so I was focused on what I had to do. So in the way, what they did when I was young, it actually paid off as I got older. But I think he was already motivated anyway, it's just the way he was, you know, it's just the way he was, you know, you know he, he, he motivated himself to do it, you know. That's where he got to where he was today, you know. As far as the strongman goes, you know, the bigger and, you know, the heavier you get, the better it is probably, you know. Over that period of time, he probably had to, you know, had to, was put on a lot of weight. He had to put on a lot of weight. So, mix things up to 200 kilograms and pushing phenomenal weights, you know. Gee, it was, I mean, there was, there was a lot of work, um, oh, we, could, we could have spent hours in the gym, you know. And we watch him in the gym and... He'd be squatting 350, I think I was there, 400 kgs, and his nose is bleeding, you know, dedicated. Um, but yeah, it's pretty cool sitting there looking, going, fuck. Yeah. Always looked at him like a superman, you know, he's always my superman.
I watch him over the years and just yeah, develop a strength in that. It was yeah, it's quite incredible. Um, I just wish he had to get the judo going with that strength and the judo combined. <laughs> it would have been a, um, yeah, unbeatable. Uh, I mean, I walked out in the gym one day over here and he was almost had his ass on the ground under a van, it was about 250 kilograms plus on it. And I thought, geez, how am I going to get it off his shoulders because he had his bum blood in here on the ground. And I rushed over, next thing he pops up with it. You know, I'm like, oh, that's all right. <laughs> and then he goes down again, does about five bounces at the bottom and shoots up and does that about six times, you know. Dropped him back on the rack and so things like that, you know. He's sort of showed a lot of strength potential straight away, you know. Man leaves this weekend to compete for the title of the strongest man on earth. Levi Veoga is already the Australasian strongman. He taught himself how to lift weights and revealed some of his other training techniques to John Newton. Sprinting with drums of sand and water, some weighing more than 150 kilograms, almost as heavy as himself at 170 kgs. Levi's training equipment is homemade, like these CNG cylinders filled with water, each one weighing 100 kilograms. But the low-tech approach suits Levi. After all, it's how he got started. I got laid off and I had no income, so I had to start competing to get the money, and I was winning competitions, and that's how I started winning, and um, I just took the prize money and gave it to my girlfriend to pay my way. To say the least, I'm actually quite, quite proud of him. He's actually come up from nowhere. Flipping a 320 kilogram forklift tyre appears quite straightforward to the big man. But even to his trainer, it's too big a challenge. To Levi, it's just like a little tube towards us, it's like changing our own little tyres with him. Whether it's lifting volcanic rock or pumping his homemade dumbbells, Levi says he's now ready for the world competition. I'm, I'm quite confident now that I've been training real hard. I, I train with a bit of aggression now. So I'm, yeah, I'm quite confident, looking forward to going there. Levi's five-year-old daughter, Chantel, struggles to get her arms around her father's biceps. But to her, the man who could be the world's strongest is still just dad. John Newton, One Network News. I got introduced to the um, sport of strongman. I was at home one day, and I lived in the Mount at the time, and I had no job, and um, I was going door to door selling sheep shit with my friend, you know. If you got that much strength, Levi, you better come to damn work with me, was my words to him. And get under a wall shed and fill some bags of sheep. Poo. <laughs> he can fill them good. He just couldn't fit under the damn wall shed. <laughs> And then one day he came around home and he goes, Hey Levi, Levi, there's a strongman competition in Tapuki. Read about it. He says, Come on, Levi. What do you reckon, brother? Is this you, man? You can do it. We laughed. Ha ha, hi, whatever. Come on, bro. And we did it. We went along. And that was the day it changed. Levi enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. We took each other on. And I had no job, and I said, oh, okay, what do you got to do? And he goes, oh, you only got to carry these wooden logs and 50 kilos in each hand and run with them 25 metres up, 25 metres back, and fastest time. And then you had to pull a little tractor and lift up these rocks, and he, go, and he goes, yeah, no one's going to beat you, Levi, because I was quite strong in those days, you know, and I was well, pretty strong, you know. And he goes, no one's going to beat you, Levi. And I said, what's the prize, man? And he goes, $300. So I said, oh, we're going to have a look then. We sold bags of sheep poo to get us to the competitions on gas. Entry money, even. But sometimes we get to the competitions with no money, just enough gas, and say, can we pay the entry fee after the competition? And I'll say, why? Because we're going to win it and pay it out of our fees. <laughs> and we would. That's how we went. That's how much I believed in them, because I knew we were going to win. Everybody knew us as that was Freddie and Levi. Yeah. We're, we're, we're two of a kind, you know, and we've been everywhere together, you know. He was known as a man who doesn't wear shoes. <laughs> but yeah, we went everywhere, and... Uh, yeah, we're like this little group, me and him, you know. Our minds together, it became a tale of, I don't believe you can't do it, Levi. You're gonna do it. You know, like I said, from the age of nine, I did want to be, the, but I, I, would, I did want to be a strongman, but I didn't really know how to get involved in the sport. So that's how I got involved in the strongman sport. So I went away to, to, went to Tapuki, and I won that event. You know, I won every event there was, against five disciplines. I won them all. And then I thought to myself, well, this is pretty cool, you know, easy 300 bucks. And I said to, I said to the organizer, I said, oh, where will you be next weekend? 
And they said, oh, we're going to be over in um, Whakatani. And I said, oh, okay. Is it pretty much what we did here in Strongman events? You know, with the same events. He goes, yeah, no, Levi, it'll be the same events. I said, oh, what's the prize money? And he goes, it'll be 500 bucks. And then straight away, ching, wise lit up and go, oh, okay, here's my new job. Let's find a way to these shows. Let's find a way to be the best. We travelled from top of the North Island to bottom of the South Island. Bags of sheep new in the vans. Levi sleeps on them like a mattress all night. With the Vicargo, Queenstown, no matter, he's sleeping on my horse with you. We wake up next day, sell 10 bags, get us to the next town. We had a ball, paid our food and refreshments. But we had a good time. So yeah, the following weekend, we met the same guy, we drove to Whakatani. We did the same events and I won it again. So I thought, this is pretty cool. So I got clever and I said, where will you be next weekend? So they said, they'll be in Matter Matter. Let's go. We'll sell five bags, that's our gas. We only gotta go 80 miles. We only need 30 bucks to sell three bags. We'll make it. Another one for a burger or two on the way. And we can do it. And we went to them, man. No matter what. We made our money on the way. Yeah, just pull over here. Yeah, this, looks, this house looks really good. You know, to go and sell some cheap shit. <laughs> made your money though. You know, but it was, uh, you know, it was a hard case. And he was always looking for places, with old places, old people's houses with gardens and stuff like that. So, and they make $20 here, $30, $40 here, $100 here. It was enough for petrol, to food to get by. And Something that is normal for him, especially being a guy that big. You know, no worries knocking on the door, but here's a young 14 year old running around knocking on the door, <laughs> selling sheep shit, you know. And yeah, no, that was funny. I went a few places with them. They pull over on the side of the road having a barbecue, but... Bro, it was good, man. It paved the way, I think, fella. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's cool times. It's cool, cool mates, yeah. So I went over to Matter Matter the following weekend. $500 won that again. That we begun our crusade from one end of Aotearoa to the other. Then when Levi was recognised, and they asked him, can you be this and that? That is when we knew we had our magic man in power. And then um, at the time there was a New Zealand strongman team, there was three guys and they competed in the Australasians against um, Australia, three Australians. And they heard about this big fellow with a mohawk winning all these little local strongmans and they said to me, hey, Levi, um, how would you like to represent New Zealand in the Australasian strongest man? And I said, yeah, no, what, what do you have to do? You know, what, what, what they said, oh, won't be like these little local ones you're doing, it's another level. Like it is, a, we have a nine ton truck pull and we have a, the wooden logs that you carry, they'll be 100 kilos in each hand and the tire will be bigger for tire flipping. I said, okay. So what I did, I started finding those tools and started training for them. Oh, we'd go around finding it. We'd go around the roadsides, look for rocks. We'd go find logs, we'd go find tires. We'd put it to Levi's place. And then we'd say, okay, Levi, When's this competition? I'll come down and visit you for two or three days. And I'd come down and train him with those things we find to train with. And we played and played and played until he had it perfect. Until they became so light. We needed bigger things. Because I don't like being, I like, when I do things, I like to be the best in what I do. Yeah, I have, uh, sports really good. Uh, Pins are great, I'll try to do my best I can. Good luck out there, Levi. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, folks. Um, I went down to Christchurch for the Royal Easter show and, and uh, <laughs> there were two events for three days, six events. I won all the events there were. Yeah, so I walked away that weekend with a um, Australasian Strongest Man title and also $2,000 cash. Yeah, and then the following six months later, they ran it again in Australia. So I went to Australia. They had changed their team. We still had the same team. And uh, I went over there, same thing again. I won every event there was, and I walked away with Australia's Strongest Man again, plus another $2,000 cash. So to me, it was like a job, you know? Here I'm doing, what I do is train, and go to do, do an event, and I win and get the prize money. Yes, yeah, so I did that for about four years. In the end, I became Australia's Strongest Man, the captain of the New Zealand team. 
and they organised a civil Levi. We think you've got enough potential to compete to the world's strongest man. And I said, okay, I said, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to put your name forward to the organisers in Australia, in England, and if they ring, if they ring you and get hold of you, it's up to you to decide what you want to do. The Matrax Trophy for the world's strongest... Enjoying the atmosphere here, and the heaviest man in this heat, Levi Vioga of New Zealand, a massive 165 kilos. Andrew Rains almost dwarfed by Vioga, former powerlifting and bodybuilding champion. And this gives the cameraman and the television director a chance. Well, anyway, about three months later, I got a phone call from them, and um, they asked, what well, they said, oh, Levi, we, um, we know you're New Zealand's strongest, or well, you know, you represent New Zealand, you're Australia's strongest man. Um, would you like to come the world's strongest man? And I said, yeah. I said, what do I need to bring? They said, no, all expenses are paid. Just bring some money, you know, your own, to bring your clothes, your bag. So I went over to Malta in 1999. Um, went over there, there was 30 competitors. And out of 30 of the biggest and strongest men in the world, I just missed the finals by half a point. And I come 11th out of 30 guys. Did you like each other? <laughs> yeah, the funny part is that uh, I've never had a coach. I've, you know, I do believe, and that sounds sarcastic, sarcastic but uh, I do believe that if I had have had a coach within the first three years, I do believe I would have been top three, world's strongest man. I had the potential, I had the strength, I had everything there, but I didn't have the coaching side of it. And because of I was the only one to do what I'd done in New Zealand, there was no one to teach me my sports. So I had to go out there and you know, sort of figure out what you had to do. And Because it wasn't just like weightlifting, it was totally different, you know. Muscles are all different, they're yeah, using it's, yeah. Come on, Levi, let's go! Give it your best, Levi, give it your best! Come on, Levi, hold on! Come on, Levi! Come on, Levi! I met Eddie hanging with Levi down here. He had his gym running, and he looked for a good partner to help him in the gym. And he goes, hey man, let's follow Eddie, bro. He's good, he's strong as. No one as strong as me, but by hell, he's got the heart to carry on training with me. And I've been his training partner for the last, don't know, 10 years, probably even a bit longer. And Eddie has never left him. He's in the gym with him. Let's go, bro. He pushes Levi, Levi pushes Eddie. They train each other. They're training partners in the gym, and they really push each other. Just approached me one day and just said to me, well, would you like to be my training partner? And said, yep. That'd be great, yeah. And that's how it, that's how it sort of developed from there. It's like, they have a, 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 a relationship that is gym related. When I see Eddie, I respect him for his gym, because the gym is not me. The gym is Eddie and Levi. Strong man world is Levi and me. I only know strong man. The dude, he had to get his mind set on, uh, on, on the rocks and try and you know, try and lift it and put it on to the bench or whatever, he, what he had to do. You know, so um, all that I think he he got that from the worlds when he when the other guys were competing and how he saw it. So it's, it's just only the the gym itself with uh, with the weights that we do is it's just to help him to get him into that position. With Eddie helping Levi. And me coming down and doing the strong man as, Lee, as Eddie does his gym work with him. Eddie will do an hour's work in the gym for the day, then I'll do three hours of strong man with Levi prior to competitions. But before the competition, Eddie will be in the gym with Levi for a couple of hours, you know, pumping it, pushing it, never giving up. Does Eddie, I've watched Eddie do his lifts from this to that. Oh, yes. this Levi training him and pushing him up, the same way Eddie pushes Levi up. He's here for him. Pretty cool here when I went to the first World's Strongest Man. It was like, you know, it was quite a buzz, you know, like, you know, from the age of nine to the age of 29, 
within what's that 20 years I become one of the world's strongest men it was like a buzz because like you know you get a free trip to Malta <laughs> all expenses paid huh? anything free is cool you know he did his training eventually recognition came and invitations came to the worlds once he won one or two competitions around New Zealand the feelers were out and they all do you want to come and he's the first person to represent New Zealand at the worlds for a long time he alone consecutively 11 years in a row, which is a great achievement to be invited for 11 years in a row in the top 16 strongest men in the world. It was then when we knew from his first invite way back that things were going to be greater. But um, it, was, um, it wasn't nervous record, it wasn't nerve reckoning until I met the guys. And man, these guys were big. Like, I mean, like, whoa, I thought I was big, but I mean, like, these muscle mass, they were just big. And it was like, whoa, they, you know, you shake their hand and just seeing guys with traps that stick up to the ears and lats that hang down like this is like, whoa. You know, and I'm here, you know, representing our small country. It's like, you know, this is pretty cool. But I, I am the 11th strongest man in the whole world. Yes, Levi was asked to but I train, I really train, I train really hard for it, like I found out what the disciplines were, I simulated events that I had to do, you know, I broke everything down, like even like training wise, you know, like like I said before, you know, I break the events right down, so if you had a like say for a tyre flip, you know, I know you got to use your, you got to use your legs, you got to use your hips, you got to use your arms, so I'd write down legs, hips, arms on a piece of paper, then I'd have truck pull, and that was like quads, hips, calves, and it was a hand over hand, so you're using your biceps as well, and lats. So I'd write that down. And I'd break everything down a little piece at a time. Then I'd look at my piece of paper and I'd go, okay, I've used my biceps here four times. My back gets used three times here. Quads used twice. And I'd look at it and go, okay. And I'd start working, so I'd do, so like back, so I, I do a lot of work on my back because there's a lot of back work there. Oh, my grips, not much grip work, so I don't use too much. So I'd break things down and I'd work on them in, like, individually, you know. And yeah, basically that's how I just started teaching myself. Yeah. Come on, Levi! Come on, New Zealand! Thank you, man. Ready! <laughs> Come on, Levi! Come on, Levi! Come on, Levi! Yep. Well, um, in Strongman, the, the disciplines were quite hard, you know. The, my, I remember the first world, first world Strongest Man I went to, we had a, um, whew, we had the Atlas stones, you know, you got the big round barrel, big round stones, you know, vary from about, I think they were 120 right up to about one, I think they were 180 the wheels in those days, you know, they're up about 220 now. But um, then we had the deadlift car, the car deadlift hold. That was, what was the one between first, uh, 10th and tenth and 11th place for that one event there. It was, um, you had to lift the back of a car off the ground for as long as you can, you know. Uh, we had a 27 ton truck pull, um, everything was heavy, like we pull, I pulled a train in South Africa in 2002 on the Zambezi Bridge, you know. But the, the good thing is with the sport though, I got to travel the world for free, you know. I mean, it was World Bull Strongest Man for 11 years and I got to travel the world for free, but the only thing it was, it wasn't a holiday. Yeah, I had to compete, so even though they took us around places to look at the place, oh, this is beautiful, this is beautiful. At the back of your mind, you you know you've got to compete, so you're not really enjoying it, you're not really soaking up the seams. Wife's having a good time, but you know, but you know, we know that we've got to compete, so, but that was one good thing I did like about the World's Strongest Man, you know, and the places you wouldn't even think of going on holiday, you know, like I've been, jeez, I've been to Malta, I've been to Malaysia, I've been to, uh, uh, Brazil, I mean, uh, Holland, Germany, uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, you know, I was, uh, I've been all around the world, I've been to a lot. This is relax mode. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, but I found that the, the, the build up for strongman was slightly different, like, because I never used to be afraid of bodybuilders at Strongman. It didn't matter what they look like. Some guys have come across, like, I competed with Mr. World, Mr. Universe at World's Strongest Man. And that, and even around New Zealand when I competed, they come across the bodybuilder fella guys, they had a nice proportion body. Didn't really worry me at all. The ones that used to worry me were the farmers. Farmers and pig hunters, they were the ones that, because the, today, showman's, you know, a farmer lifts a tire, he'll lift a rock out of the way, he'll carry a fence post up a hill. Pig hunter carries a pig out of the bush. A lot of endurance strength. 
So they were the ones that used to give me my run for my money. Bodybuilder, I wouldn't worry about them. Not running them down, no. They look for these sporters, but when it comes to strongmen, it didn't really worry me. They didn't really, you know, didn't worry me at all. Pig hunters and farmers are the ones that used to always give me a run for my money, and they're the ones I used to worry about. And they were like deceiving because they didn't look the part, but they were they were deceiving. They like undercover bodybuilders, yeah. But, um, there's Levi. Hi. Putting on his shoes still. I, I, I tell you what, we're because uh, in 1999 my wife was pregnant with our first daughter, and uh, we're in we're in Malta, and we had a real small. It was me, Nico Nunga from uh, he was in a, a gridiron fellow from the USA, but he was uh, I think he was Samoan, so he's representing Samoa. And anyway, we were in the lift, and so it was my wife with a big puffer out here. And it was me like this, and then him he was like this, and the lift was only about oh. About a two metre wide, a little square box. Well, anyway, we hop on the lift and we're going down, down, down. And the next minute it stops and then it wouldn't move. And then uh, it was like, oh no. And we could just, we sort of got the door open a little bit. We could just see a little gap in there because we we're like, the level was here and we were down here with the floor was here. It was like, hey. And all those two men saying, I've never seen them before you. And they were over there, come over there laughing at us. And my wife, she gets claustrophobic. So she started panicking and we're laughing. Next the guys up there and they're drawing the door open you know? <laughs> And then we're trying to climb out. Then we're trying to pull my wife out. Yeah, that was quite fun, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, but I'm not you know, I met Yorker Hula, you know, and, um, Magnus Samuelson, um, Sven Kelsen, the Viking, um, basically, you know, to this day, all the, all the older strongmen guys, you know, like Torby Olsen and oh, pretty much, pretty much all of them, you know, yeah. Pushinovsky, like, um, he was a freak, you know. I met him in 2002, and like 130 kilos, probably three percent body fat. He was one of the, at the time, I'd say he would have been the most pleasing shaped body uh, strongman I would have ever seen. Yeah, he was a freak, yeah. yeah. And for his age, 21 years old, to win World's Strongest Man, very impressive, yeah, very impressive. Yay, <laughs> but yeah, it is a brutal sport for, the, for injuries, yeah. If you're gonna do an injury, they're usually bad. Yeah, like I've seen bicep tenders, bite, you know, um, you know log lifting. Um, I had a, had a finger tendon and had a tear. I've done a, a meniscus tear in my knee. Yeah, carrying a hundred kilo roll of carpets. You know, it was a, uh, it was a, uh, two barrels, two hundred kilo barrels, and two one hundred kilo rolls of carpets, and you had to throw it onto your shoulder. Well, I picked it up, threw it onto my shoulder, ran with it, threw it on the truck, and when I spun around to run back, my right leg stayed there, but my body tense, so my 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 knee just went. And I tore my meniscus in my, in my knee, so I've had some bad injuries. I had a finger injury when uh, I was getting my, my calf was going tight, so I was getting a massage. Meanwhile, the other guys out there practicing on the equipment there before the event, and I thought I'll be all right, but it was a fridge, yeah, a fridge in a washing machine, yeah. So I got, when I got to do that, <laughs> I got to do the events. So I tried to figure out how do you lift this washing machine. I said, I saw that I'll be just like a barrel. So I picked up that, ran with that, threw it on there. Then they come back to the fridge, and I seen, oh. What am I going to grab? So I, at the back of the fridge, you got those little, like, little grill, grill, you know? And, and I said, I stuck my fingers in the grill and just lifted it up and grab it. And then like, after the event, I had torn the tendon in my finger. <laughs> so you know, we do get injured, but you just got hard enough. <laughs> But before I was a strong man, <laughs> going back a little bit before that, I actually was New Zealand heavyweight sumo champ as well. Yeah, and how I got involved with sumo is uh, I went to a competition with my friend, and at half time they had a competition who could throw out the New Zealand sumo wrestling champ. Yeah, and my mates are going, oh, Levi, here we go, here we go. And I said, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not going to take my clothes off and wear that nappy. And the organizers heard it, and they said, no, nah, no, nah, Levi, you can leave your clothes on. I said, oh, okay. So I jumped in the ring, had a go, and I threw him out. And, yeah, and I helped him off the ground again and uh, threw him out again. And then, anyway, after the competition, the organisers come up to me and said, Oh, Levi, how would you like to take it up as a sport? You know, you just threw New Zealand, um, New Zealand sumo wrestling champ out. And I said, Oh, yeah, but I live so far away, I can't um, come to your club because it's an hour and a half drive. And I said, But I'll tell you what, if you've got any videos of sumo wrestling, I'll teach myself. So they sent me four videos up to where I lived. 
I watched those videos over and over and over again, slow motion, the way they, if he threw something out, how his feet was positioned, how his hands was positioned, I mastered everything. And then I went up to Auckland and I threw all the big fellas out, the heaviest guy was 200 kilo, threw them all out and I became heavyweight sumo champ in New Zealand. And that's how I got involved then, and then from then I went to Strongman. Yeah. Like the same, I got introduced to my wife, you know, because like, I knew I was going to do something, something weird all my life, you know. <laughs> and I know you've got to have support, you know, and you can't have, you can't be with somebody that's not going to support you, you right? You know, you've got to have someone that's going to support you 100%. So I thought, well, I'm going to need somebody that's into what I'm doing, so I'm going to have to find a lady that's at the gym. <laughs> I'd walked into the city gym with one of my cousins, she, um, when I was staying with her, and she said, I'll come to the gym for the first time. I said, oh yeah, okay, I'll come down. And yeah, I walked in, I didn't really take much notice of him at all. There was just all these guys in a gym, so I sort of just hung out with my cousin. I was uh, looking in the mirror. Yeah, Levi was staring at the mirror, and I, I didn't actually notice Levi at first, but all I saw was this fella staring at himself. I said, oh, typical gym, look at that fella, he's just staring at himself, hard out. <laughs> and then when I met Levi, he was going, no, darling, I was actually using the mirror to stare at you. Like, oh, 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 that's a, that's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's when it all started. 28 years later, we're still together. So I found a lady that was at the gym, you know, I met my wife there, and um, she's been with me 100%, and, um, and like times was hard, you know, sometimes she was in the army, she got a job in the army, so she worked in the army. Did my stint there, and from there we ended up moving around the country with it for a while before we actually ended up here, so. And because of the army's family orientated, they were able to get, able, she was able to get time off work and stuff, you know what I mean? Like if it was here, a normal job, she would have to take leave, and if you got no leave, they wouldn't, leave, they wouldn't let you take time off, you know? But so that, in the way, it was like her lifestyle was suited what we are doing as well. We had to get time off here, you know, sponsorship. I got sponsored. And now we're going to take all of our gears downstairs and we'll do a bit of filming downstairs. Say bye, Levi. It's like I said, I died the other day, you know? When you look at about it, when you think about it, like, without, um, without, you know, thy support, there would be no way my journey would have been like this, you know what I mean? Yeah, because she's been through thick and thin with it, having to put up with me, helping me so much. So really, we're a team on our own. So, you know, she was like my coach, my masseuse, <laughs> my physiotherapist, she's everything, my mentor. Yeah, so that was, that was, yeah, that was quite special. He's always, because he, he was in the gym environment when I first met him, and he was always trying to eat healthy and eat regularly and constantly, it was always a struggle, right from the start, to actually feed him all the time. And I never used to be this big, right? You know, like when I was 18 years old, I was in the army as a grunt, and I only weighed 80 kilos. It was even like, Times were so tough having to pay our rent and, and paying the, the power bill and all that sort of stuff. So with food, we would struggle quite quite a lot, not having enough money to actually um, feed ourselves. So it was like he'd have, get a two litre bottle of milk and he'd pour half of it into another two litre and then he'd add water to it so he'd end up with four litres just so he had his milk supplement to go through the day. So like I said, you know, it wouldn't have looked like this if I was a diver with a diving board or in a rowing machine in a rower. You know, I wouldn't get my cheeks in there at the moment, maybe one on each side. But yeah, I don't fit in the rowing, uh, rowing boat. But um, yeah, so... To be one of the biggest and strongest men in the world, I had to eat a lot, you know, keep my calories up. We'd buy boxes of fish and, and ration it out so he'd have enough to go through for the week type stuff, so. So, for, for instance, like, for breakfast, I'd have a bowl of raw porridge. And how I used to make my porridge, I used to just get the rolled oaks, tip it into an, um, a, a bowl, handful of raisins, two bananas, chop them up, mash it up, turn the hot water tap on, put it on the hot water tap, mix it up, and that was my porridge. And then I'd have four pieces of toast, and I'd have 15 eggs and a protein shake. That's my breakfast. Then I'd go away and train. I'd train probably for about, I don't know, probably about two hours I'd train in the morning. Could be three, depending on what I'm training for. And then I'd have another protein shake with a couple of bananas. And then um, down there after that I'd have my lunch. And for lunch I'd have a half a kilo of kumara, a half a kilo of um, chicken, and 300 grams of broccoli. Yeah, and then after that, an hour after that, I'd have another protein shake. Then I'd go to the gym, and I'd train for another two hours or three hours, depending again. So I'd train like six hours a day. And then I'd have another protein shake after that. And then I'd have my dinner. And my dinner, I'd have another half a kilo of kumara, half a kilo of chicken, and another 300 grams of broccoli, right? But just before I go to bed, I'd have another meal. I'd have another 15 eggs. So on one day, I was having one kilo of chicken, one kilo of kumara, uh, 600 grams of broccoli, probably about three or four protein shakes and 30 eggs. And a couple of bits of toast, you know. But um, that's in one day, yeah. So in over a week, you know, it's 240 eggs and seven kilos of chicken and seven kilos of kumara. <laughs> it's always been a struggle to feed him. 
even to, even to, up to today. Because um, as I was saying before, I'm actually in the kitchen. By the time I get home from work, I'm in the kitchen cooking our dinner. And he eats so much, there's normally not any leftovers left for the next day, so I can cook him a, a meal for that. So I'm waking up in the morning after I, I train in the morning with him, I'm cooking again so that he's got his meals for the day. So he's, yeah, he's, all, he's always been a big eater and it's always been a struggle to feed him. <laughs> I got sponsored by the army, bro, food. I got sponsored by the, he's in an army. So what happened? I told them I was getting to going overseas and I wanted to get bigger, you know, get yeah, bigger. So, yeah, I wanted to get bigger and you know, eat more. So yeah, I asked the army if they'd sponsor me. Because my mate with the army just said, oh, they better just show this up to the pigs, you know, because that's, that's what it's for, you can't just keep it. So I asked them if I could go in there and get um, food after all the cadets have all gone. And they said, yeah, it's not a problem. So I used to go in there like four or five ice cream containers and I go out to the Bay Marines and I get all the food out of them and all that. Hey, I got real big, eh? <laughs> Sponsored by the army. This is funny, the army yes. even let you use their buildings to put your gym in when it got too big to help have it home, eh? They yeah, said, yeah. They said you could use and... Calibre! Yeah, no, it was, um, yeah, they gave me my buildings for um put on my army stuff and my gym equipment in, so yeah, no, it was really good, eh? And yeah, you said the basic training used to come in, or the instructors used to bring them over and stop out, stop them all outside your gym, eh? So you could give them a bit of a talk. Yeah, it's like a motivational speech for the about four platoons come in, so they one they all line up outside, and then one platoon would come into the gym and they look at all my photos and that. This is in the army, and I tell them all the stories and I know, show them a few things, and that platoon would go out and the next platoon would come in and I tell them a story again, talk to them, show them, explain things to my about my gym. And then right there, and they all did a thing for me, and um, it all shot off, and that was pretty cool. Well, he was a family man, you know. He was always a family man. I mean, um, he he virtually stayed at home to look after the kids while I was in the army. You see, which these days is very hard because, like, working days. You know, everybody goes to work because it's hard to stay home because it's expensive to live at home, you know. But in the days, you know, your mum would stay home and dad would work. But now it's like the other way around. But because my wife was in the army, you know, they looked after us and all that because, you know, the family oriented of the army. So I got to look after my children, take them to kindy, bring them home. I had one at the time, one daughter at the time. Take her to kindy and I go home, sit home, do her homework with her, you know, and uh, teach her to read. Did a really good job of looking after her. Um, he would even walk, put her on his backpack and walk, because well, part of his training, she was the weight and he'd be walking around the bridges in Wanganui. And he Obviously he still needed to train when he had me, so I was in his backpack with weights attached to us both around his ankles and he would use a spoon to make sure that I was okay so he could look over and shoulder and make sure that I was still there. Just to check that she's alright, the, the hat's still on her head when he's walking around with her. But yeah, that's all he did was walk me around and <laughs> that's basically what he did with me in town and stuff, he was constantly training. So there's nothing else in the world that man wanted to do other than train and eat. I spent a lot of time with my daughter, you know, and then um, which a lot of fathers couldn't do because they had to work. So I was, in a way, I was quite a lucky person, you know. And then we had another child. So I got two girls, and same again, I've got to raise both of them. She was she had her own little events when he was outside training because she wanted to be out there with her father all the time. Apparently, when I was three years old, I was flipping tires. So he was doing his thing in the backyard, and I was following along with my little car tire flipping alongside of him. So he set up a little, like a little empty tyre from a, a motorcycle type thing. She'd just sit there, play with the tyre, and she'd be doing stuff right along beside him. You know, and um, yeah, I thought that was quite cool because like, like these days, you know, it's very hard. Mum and Dad both go to work. So I was lucky to actually spend time with my children and while my wife worked, you know. And plus I was doing my sport as well. Out of nowhere, who has no job, used to work, you know, selling sheep shit, basically, and then going into this huge competition representing New Zealand and then from there to Australia, and then from Australia going to represent New Zealand in the World Games, it's quite quite full on, actually. So yeah, it was pretty cool. I loved it, eh? But to be quite honest, my mum's just as strong as my father, you know, both mentally and somewhat physically. I, I find that both of them are really good together. This has sort of been in the training environment, but we've never pushed them to do anything with it. It's a matter of, um, Levi's lived and breathed the gym since he was 16 type thing, probably even younger. That's just when um, I remember him saying he got his gym membership. But it's been, um, for them, it's been quite hard in respect of, I think sometimes they feel a bit of pressure that they have to come to the gym, but they don't, Levi's never pushed them to do it. So Justine is actually doing quite well at the moment with her strength and, and for her shot put. Yeah, no, and then from what he knows, he teaches me. Because since he's self-taught as well, he's also self-teaching me on how my shot put. So all I do is just watch everything, train my legs hard. Cause and she uses her gym and her training for that, so it's, it's been good. Yeah,
I think the sport in New Zealand in my day was um, like no one really knew about it, you know. So, like every time we go to Bull Strongest Man, I've been on TV One News and I let them know what I was doing, all that. So, I was kind of promoting the sport. I mean, sports, in, I believe, is not as big as it could potentially be. It hasn't really been pushed out there. It's, it's not a highly recognised sport, and it's only if you're into the, the gym environment and you know what the strongman type arena is that it actually gets out there. Um, you know, you were going like a few years down the line now, I think strongman in New Zealand, New Zealand has gotten a lot bigger. CrossFit's come in now, which is sort of like speed work of strongman, but yeah, in New Zealand, yeah, strongman has gotten a lot bigger than it was way back in 1999, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Got to beat 58 seconds of Michael Sedanius. Can he do it? Oh, I've seen some injuries in my days, yeah. I've seen one of the guys with his knee blowing out. I've seen backs, I've seen dislocations, yeah, it's... It's just a brutal sport, it's just part of the sport, you know? Picks it up, grabs it, picks it up. I've never seen anything like this fella. Yeah, because if I get an injury, I'm a, you know, I get real depressed, you know, like any athlete would, you know, not being able to train with them, you know, and you do get injuries in our sport, you know. It's not an easy sport, you know, like you don't just go in there and do a little, a little truck pull. You know, the truck's like 27 tonne, you know, it's not a five tonne truck, so everything's hard. So something's going to snap or break eventually if you ever prepare yourself for it. But you do come across injuries, I mean, and being a, an athlete and being at the top level that I got to, once I got an injury, it was like depressing because it sets you back in time, you know. You like you might have a two week break, and while you're sitting around trying to recover, you've got athletes around the world that are still competing, and it used to play on my mind all the time. But you pick yourself up and you enter it and you go. You never give up. Never give up is the whole secret. The support for my wife was quite good there. Yeah, just to sort of keep me motivated to say, well, Levi, you know, you know, you're going to come right and, you know, it's not the end of the world. And yeah, because I get real depressed if I can't train, you know. That was, like I said, for nine years old, I've been doing things, you know, lifting weights and that. Levi, like anyone, has a feeling inside of them, oh, can I keep going? Will I keep doing it? But when that heart of his turns on, an encouragement of the likes of myself and Eddie and his wife and his children, keep him going. And by tell you, that strength comes out. So yeah, it was really, yeah, but the support of the family was quite good. It wasn't too hard really, unless I got injured. <laughs> This, we got so we were inundated with people who said yes I have amazing talent and we've got some more of them in for us tonight to kick things off we have Australasia guy not just Australia but Australasia's strongest man Levi who is now going to lift 150 kilograms worth of tyres here ladies and gentlemen Australasia's strongest man Levi <laughs> There's the clean. Here comes the oh, yeah. Amazing talent as well as Frank Oz, Sean Ashton, Amelia Cromartie, Green Spoon, Rob the next the umbilical brothers you can put there. Different people, you know, like you've got the people that go to gyms and they, they love you, but only certain people in the world or certain people in even New Zealand can pull a 27 tonne truck. You know, only certain people will be able to pull a 18 tonne train. Only certain people can tip over a car. Like, I can do powerlifting, right? I can deadlift, I can squat, I can bench. Powerlifting, I can weightlift, you know, clean and jerk, I can do all that. But can they do that like I do in my sport, you know? Can they pull a truck? See, they can't, they can't unless they're a freak. You know, they, not, not everybody can do our sport. We're, we call it, we're still like special people, different, we're different people, you know? Yeah, to do what we do is, is pretty much abnormal. <laughs> You know, like, you, you do get the guys that um that can, like, say, can do the weightlifting side of it and all that, but they can't pull the truck, you know? But we, you know, it's, it's just, I don't know, it's just freaky genetic, I think. I think it's an impressive sport. 
and uh, like I said, you, there's a lot of discipline required in it. You've got to be mentally strong as well. Um, I reckon, I reckon strong, you know, I, I encourage everybody to, to get into it, you know. It's a, it's a good sport, you know. What I've found is meeting all the other strong men over there and their partners and stuff, it is a big, although you're competitive in the arena, outside of it, everyone's quite social. It's a really, it is a really good supportive sport, regardless. So, I mean, you've got your, we're, when we're there, we're cheering on for the competitors and the same for them, they're cheering on as well if they see you giving it all. So it's like, you know, all these years, people have done weightlifting and you know, doing things like that, but I mean, like, just to be able to say, you know, you've pulled a 27 ton truck, you know, or you pulled a train and it's, you've got to experience it, you know what I mean? But like I say, you know, you've got to, you've either got it or you haven't. Yeah. With my sports, you know, um, I was lucky because I got a job out of it. So I ended up doing um, working for Mighty Team Mega and doing strength displays for open days and all that. He was in the strongman, the world strongman. They paid for everything for him to go over. So it was a matter of if I could get myself over there, my accommodation and my meals and everything was sorted. So Mighty Ten, um, we did a lot of fundraising initially before he was with Mighty Ten and um, army fundraising type stuff. So they helped me get over to the first couple of shows. And once we got on board with Mighty Ten, because he was in an overseas arena, they were quite willing to help for his expenses. So they actually paid for me to, to go and support him and all these shows over there, so it was awesome. And then um, once I left with them, I was with them for 10 years, once I left with them, I thought to myself, you know, well, I'm gonna have to get a job now because everybody has to work, you know? And I sort of said to myself, um, I don't really want to work for anybody because I don't like being lazy, I don't like being told off. So I thought, uh, I'll open up a women's gym. Yeah, so what I did, I looked down, went down a Tybee, looked around and uh, found me a building and um, I opened up a women's gym with my mates. Bring the barbecue down in the summer. And we'll be happy. Uh. Hey, you know, this is it, bro. Woman's only gym. Except for me, boy. And you've got, I've got to learn, and I like helping people. I love helping people, you know. And like I said, our lady had a shoulder injury for 10 years, never been able to raise your arm, and then like, four treatments, I've put her arm above her head. To me, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Like I said, I don't actually believe people realise how many times he has been overseas and what he's actually done to get himself overseas. He's actually put a lot of, like I said, going out and selling sheep manure just to make ends meet so he can go from one event to another initially to start him off. I think he, some of the New Zealand public didn't even realise what he used to do. No, I mean, the effort that he's put into it, you know, it's just relentless in his training. The schedule was just, you know, and eating and everything was revolved around that. And it really should have had a lot more recognition, you know. I certainly admire what he does. After doing strongman, a lot of people don't appreciate what they go through and how much they push their body. It's not pushing your body 100%, you, you're going 110% to, to compete in it. So, uh, yeah, no, it was, uh, yeah, I admire what he's done, that's for sure. There's a lot of stories that people aren't actually aware that he's actually done. And it's been a lot of hard work. And um, He's had a lot of people that have supported him along the way, and without them he would not have been where he is now. So. Levi Viagra of New Zealand, 165 kilograms he weighs. That's an enormous amount of weight, but he's a very mobile man. The time to beat. Watch the clock in the top left-hand corner. 25.8 seconds by Heinz Olesch. He's got it moving. We saw him sprinting, and I mean sprinting, around the compound the other day, throwing a rugby ball around. He's pretty nifty and obviously very strong, massively strong. But what a time set by Heinz Olesch. Yes. Go, it's go. clicking away, 25, 26. Not... If someone wants to get into the sport and they come and saw me and uh, they live close, I'd say, I'll look after you. <laughs> and I love, because I'd love to train somebody to take them to that level if they've got the, if they've, if they've got the, the, the passion and, and, uh, and they live close, because I live in the middle of nowhere, but if they've got the passion, I'd love to train somebody to be like me. Because he's always willing to help them. So I say it's a, it's a hard road ahead. Yeah, I'd 
always like, I've always liked that, you know. Like we said, we don't live forever. Well, I kind of do. I'm Benjamin bro- Benjamin Buttons' brother, you know, Levi Buttons. I go backwards. I don't get old. Anyway, <laughs> it's like um, I'd love to train somebody to become world's strongest man, or even just one of the best in, the, in New Zealand, you know. A lot of people, I say, you know, if you believe in yourself, you can achieve anything in life, you know. Everything's possible. It just depends on how much determination the individual's got themselves, how much effort they're willing to put in as well. Eat, sleep and train. That was his life for many years. Hard work. That's, that's the most I can say, it's just hard work. And you have to be passionate about what you want to do. Well, proud. Definitely proud of my brother. They mentor bro and their commitment and know that um, they go, you want to do it, eh bro, I guess. You know, you know it's, there's no such thing as no, you know, you either do it or you don't, that's it. No matter who you are, no matter how big or small you are, your heart still beats. The smallest man can win against the biggest man. A lot of guts, a lot of determination, you know. So easy to um, lay back on the couch and watch TV instead of coming and doing, you know, hours and hours of training, you know. Anything's possible if you set your mind to it. Anything's possible, mate, you know. No such thing as can't. That's can with a capital T for two Mickey. And like I said, for me, from the age of nine years old, I want to be one of the biggest and strongest men in the world, you know. I've been, I did other things, you know, but at the back of my mind is what I really wanted to do. And um, look at that, a few years down the line, I did become one of the biggest and strongest men in the world, you know. You always seem to be enjoying it, right? Oh, I love it. Yeah, I love it. It's good fun. <laughs> did you have a chance to look at the view while you were doing yeah, it? Yeah, I did, yeah, I saw the old. If you believe it, you can achieve it, yeah. I tell all the kids, you know, and, I, and I've gone around a lot of schools around New Zealand and I tell my motivation story to them all that. And um, yeah, it's, you can do anything you want in life, if you want, as long as you put your mind to it, you know. And like I said, if you're focused and really want it and you, you go for it, you will become it. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. What was the question, bro? <laughs> <laughs> That's going in the end of the credits. <laughs>